Okay, so now um, after introducing their organizations, I'm going to introduce the panelists themselves. Elisa Bieria is an assistant professor in ethnic studies at the University of California, Riverside. She is. <laughs> She is a co-founder of Survived and Punished, a national initiative that develops policy, legal advocacy strategies, and community education, um, and organizing materials that challenge the criminalization of survivors of domestic violence and sexual violence. Colby Len is a... <laughs> <laughs> is a Davis Putter Scholar and PhD candidate in American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. Colby's research centers uh, the analysis of imprisoned people in California's women's prisons, including survivors of gender violence and movement organizers who are serving life and death sentences. Colby is a longtime organizer and legal advocate with, this, with CCWP and a co-founder and organizer with Survived and Punished. Our next panelist is Romarilyn Ralston. For three decades, Romarilyn has organized for gender and racial justice and against the violence of imprisonment, first while incarcerated and most recently as an advocate on the outside. Romarilyn is currently the program co coordinator for Project Rebound at California State University Fullerton which provides formerly incarcerated students with tools and opportunities to help them thrive as scholars. She is also an organizer with CCWP, a recent fellow of the Women's Foundation of California Women's Policy Institute, and a graduate of Just Leadership USA's Leading with Conviction program. Beth Ritchie is department head in criminology, <laughs> law and society, law and justice and Professor of African American Studies at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Um, the emphasis of her scholarly and activist work has been on the ways that race and ethnicity and social position affect women's experience of violence and incarceration, focusing on the experiences of African American battered women and sexual assault survivors. Beth is the author of Arrested Justice, Black Women, Violence, and America's Prison Nation. Her work has been recognized with numerous awards, including the Audre Lorde Legacy Award from the Union Institute and the Advocacy Award from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. She's a founding member of Insight, um, and she was also generous enough to lead a seminar yesterday for selected UCLA graduate and undergraduate students. We're so grateful that she was able to provide the opportunity for our students to learn from her. Finally, our moderator this afternoon is Grace Hong. She is Professor of Gender Studies and Asian American Studies at UCLA, Chair of CSW's um, Advisory Committee and Organizer with CCWP. She teaches courses on women of color feminism, feminist knowledge production, and neoliberalism. She is the author of Death Beyond Disavowal, The Impossible Politics of Difference, and Ruptures of American Capital, Women of Color Feminism, and the cultures of in immigrant labor. Please help me welcome this brilliant and inspiring group of scholar actors. Um, so uh, I am so delighted and um, you know uh, and and honored to be a part of this keynote. Uh, panel um, and uh, just want to turn it over to this amazing panel. Um, so um, I just wanted to um, start off by inviting you to say just a little bit about um, some of the issues you've been working on, you know, what you think is sort of the most pressing issue um, in your work today, um, and maybe we can just start off with that. I mean, we don't have to start with me just because I'm over here. <laughs> okay, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. Um, thank you so much. This is, this is such, I mean, I just don't really have the words, the, the honor to be up here with these incredible people who have deeply influenced me for years, but um, we have limited time. But also, CSW and Thinking Gender and Sarah and Grace and the whole organizing team. I was telling Sarah and Romarilyn that my first, um, I, and I also told them I wouldn't cry, so let's try to keep that promise. Um, 
the my first graduate student conference was thinking gender. It was like a thousand years ago, but it was my it was the first time that I was able to present on my dissertation. Well, well it was very raw then. It was like a you know a paragraph. It wasn't. <laughs> But, um, and I still remember it like it was yesterday because Aisha Finch moderated the panel and she was so lovely and generous and treated me like what I had to say was important and wow. you know relevant and whatnot. And so, um, so it's just very strange and, and wonderful to, for, this to, for this opportunity. Anyways, um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Most pressing issue. Um, so many pressing issues. I mean, I, I, when, when question, when I am facing questions like that, I always go back to, um, <laughs> I always go back to Marissa Alexander's quote. So um, Marissa Alexander, I'm sure you know, um, was the, um, is the black woman from Florida, mother of three, who defended herself from her abusive husband. Um, fired the warning shot, um, tried to invoke Sandra Ground, and was denied. Um, and, uh, you know, went to trial, event, et cetera, et cetera. She's free now. She's amazing. Go find her on Twitter. Um, so, but she said when she was in the thick of things, she said, um, when you do, and I won't get this quote exactly right, but she said, when you do everything that the law says you're supposed to do, but the law wasn't meant for you, right? Where do you go from there? And that quote always just stuck with me. It hit me hard because the quote, you can, you can think of it as a, as a representation of despair, of, having, of like, where do you go from there? And where do you go from there, right? There's, it's as if there's nothing else to do and you're just kind of facing the abyss. Um, and I feel that despair, but I also, the way that I heard it also was like a, a challenge, like a, um, um, you know, what are you, the, the, an invitation for us to try to figure out what there is to do next, what is in our power to um, move forward in a situation that is constructed as deeply impossible, um, but it, um, but we're not allowed to just do nothing. So, um, so that invitation, I take it very seriously. And I like to think about it in juxtaposition to um, efforts to do community accountability and transformative justice work. Like one place where we go is to um, build the, the tools that we need to fully divest from an institution that is profoundly violent um, to black women and many other people. And, um, and it also just invites us to build the coalitions and the relationships that we need, build, be as imaginative and thoughtful and creative as possible, to and brave as possible, to do the things that we don't think that we can do, but we have to do it anyway, right? So that's not a specific answer to the question, but that's my best, okay? And your best is always very good. It's always very good. What, how moving that you had that experience at this conference. Um, it was so amazing to me to be at that seminar yesterday because just like I imagine was true when you were there, the kind of radical um, imaginatory, the work that people are doing is um, inspiring, humbling, and revolutionary. So for all of you who were there, thank you. I have continued to think about our discussion. And then I know there are people who couldn't be there, and so I assume that there are many people in this room who are um, radically thinking about how to change the world, and I'm so grateful to be part of this discussion. Thanks for having me. I, I'm really digging California. I really am. And it's not just because it's so cold in Chicago. It's not, I promise you. Um, so a couple of things uh, occurred to me in response to that question. Grace, thanks for moderating this panel. One is um, I'm still worried, I have been for a long time, still worried about anti-black racism in the dominant organization's attempt to end gender violence. 
and the way that that attempt will continue to fail until anti-black racism is part of the agenda and understood to be violence. Um, I'm still worried about the ways that struggles for black uh, liberation, old struggles and new struggles for black liberation continue to ignore gender violence, uh, issues of transphobia, the ways that we aren't, are, can't, some of us, be our full selves in those liberatory struggles, even if you want to call yourself a feminist-oriented, queer, positive space. So I'm worried about those two things. And in some ways, I'm more worried about it now than I was almost 40 years ago that I started doing this work because now I walk into space and everybody can raise their hand about being against racism. Uh, and I can't tell you how many abolitionists I meet who participate in building the carceral state. So to me, it's almost more dangerous because I don't know who's out there and what everybody's doing. And um, you know, part of it is because you know I'm going to be 62, and a lot of things I can't always like stay as sharp as I was. But it's also just because um, of of how co-optation uh, is still. Um, is still with us and, and is dangerous. And it's especially dangerous, those two things I'm still worried about, especially dangerous because we continue to build up the prison nation, don't we? And that's, I know, what we're here to talk about. Um, we're not, uh, even if we're not building buildings the way we once were, we're still building the prison nation because they're, you know, the carcerality is coming out into the so-called free world. And so I'm worried about those things. Um, I uh, I saw Dylan do something like this when you realize how long it was that we did the critical resistance insight statement. That was a long time ago. And when I think about, uh, that's Dylan Rodriguez, by the way, we sat in a small group. I don't know, there were seven of us, eight of us, you know, trying to ha having that discussion. It was a long weekend. It felt like it was three years, but it was over a weekend. We worked on that statement together. And um, I know Andy Smith and Mimi Kim are here, also co-founders of Insight. And you know, we thought we were gonna just kind of do Insight, and then we'd be done. Um, well, we're not done yet, so here we still are. Um, so those are like the big things I'm worried about. Um, I want to just rattle off some other things I'm worried about because I want you all to fix this, please. I am very worried about Title IX, Me Too, sex offender registry, and all of the carcerality in that uh, as one of the new frontiers. I'm very worried about the ways that anti-black racism is getting all tied up again in issues of freedom for Palestinian people. Very worried about that again. I'm worried about the Violence Against Women Act that you know, can't pass because it includes attention to trans lives in it. Still, we're, I'm still worried about that. Um, I'm worried about the ways that we continue to not dig deep on the structural issues of violence. So um, that's kind of a, I mean, it, it was meant to sound more like a rant that it sounded like. Like I really wanted to like stand up and be articulating those things. But um, even though I'm sitting here, I want you to know I'm deeply worried about those because those are the places that I feel like people are kind of making claims about gender justice, about um, trying to end gender violence, about talking about anti-black racism. And I think we're not, we're not doing it in a seriously, serious enough or imaginative enough way. And I should say that as I ramble about those things, and I will stop doing this and pass it on to other people, it is important to me that we keep centered, and I said it yesterday, I'm gonna say it, say it, say it, that we have to remember the seriousness of the violence of incarceration and the violence of violence. And by that I mean freeing people is what we're supposed to be doing. And so every person who walks out of those cages um, deserve our uh, attention, right? And every person who gets free from the tyranny of the kind of abuse that has to be kept secret in our lives uh, deserves our attention. And until we're 
serious about, like I know there were a lot of people who wanted to come here and this was overbooked and all that, how wonderful, but this should, you know, what about those people who, who just couldn't get here? Not because they were late signing up, but they s were not paying enough attention to those people who are still locked up. And I mean locked up, like locked up inside, but locked up, locked up in other kind of places, right? So anyway, the seriousness of that I want to bring into the discussion. And I'm still, I'm still worried about those things. Thank you, Beth. Wow. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for organizing this beautiful Sarah, Haley, Grace, all of my panelists here. I'm, I'm super stoked about being here. This is really dope to sit out here and, and see all of you who are, I hope, doing movement work, anti-prison work, anti-violence work, anti-racist work. If you're doing that work, raise your hand so that people can know that you're doing this work. Because you should be visible. People should know the work that you're doing and who you're doing the work for. I mean, if, if you're an undercover, radical, abolitionist or um, advocate, you're not doing the work. People need to know what you're doing. And you need to be proud of the work that you're doing and who you're doing it for. Because if it wasn't for folks on this stage, I wouldn't be sitting here. I spent half my life in a prison cell. And if it wasn't for the volunteers, the work of people creating insight, the work of scholars sacrificing their own work to volunteer, to come and visit me while I was in prison or to campaign on my behalf to get me free, I wouldn't have this mic in my hand. So if you are doing this work, you need to be proud about doing it and you need to be loud about doing it. And that's what progress is. That's how we move this movement. We move people. And so I just want to encourage you to to do that, be loud about it, and make some noise and make some change. And so to Grace's awesome question about what are some of the most pressing challenges that I see, uh, there's so many, um, old and new. Voting rights, you know? Folks who have criminal records are still disenfranchised from voting. For some states, indefinitely. We're starting to move that needle a little bit with Alabama and with Florida, but it took a very long time to do that. And so we need to keep working on these things that every person in this country should have the right to do. Voting is extremely important, and I want to shout out an organization who's here, um, Initiate Justice, Taina's here, um, and, and Richie. They've been doing really great work, you know, trying to get voting rights restored to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And we need to get behind this. So other things, uh, of, of course, is access to higher education for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. The work that I do with Project Rebound at Cal State Fullerton it's just one of nine campuses that are doing this work that started back at San Francisco State in 1967. So we know we're sitting here at UCLA, one of the finest universities in the state of California. It changes minds. It changes the world. It, makes, it creates change makers here. What you have access to on this campus everyone should have access to regardless of their past, which we all have. We all have a past. And if we are constantly defined by our worst moment in life, then we have a problem. Then we really don't believe in second chances. We really don't believe in redemption. We really don't want to get people free. If we're going to hold them hostage to something that they did in their past, whether they're juvenile, whether they were on drugs, whether they were traumatized and fighting for their life, defending their life, 
we have to really get smart and stay committed to making sure that the challenges that we still face today around anti-violence work gets addressed. We shouldn't still be talking about the same old stuff 30 and 40 years later. The work that we've done has been awesome. I'm sitting here on this stage as a living witness to that work. But there's so much more work that needs to be done. And now we're addressing solitary confinement, juvenile justice issues. I mean, the beat goes on and on and on. Because we live in a world that we really can't imagine without prisons, but we want to. Because if we really thought about a world without prisons, we'd do something about it. I don't really think we're doing enough. We're writing about it. We're talking about it. You know, the folks on this stage has been, you know, getting one person out at a time, and that's great work. But we need to make our voices heard, our power heard in Sacramento, in D.C., where we can liberate the masses. You know, if we're really concerned about mass incarceration, we want to eliminate the prison industrial complex, we can do it. We are the masses. We are the people. And I think it's time for us to, to really stand up and get radical about it and create this, this revolution that we talk about. Because it's real, and we're on the verge of it. Every time there's a mass shooting at a school or another African-American man is shot down in the street by a police officer, we get radical. But then we wait until there's another incident. We need to always stay on that page until we're all free none of us are free and so i just want to encourage us to stay committed to those things and that's what i see as the most pressing problem within this movement within the work that even i do so that we get tired and that we're not training enough of you to go out and do the work and i think we really need to get smart about making sure that our movement stays ready and is out there doing the work every day, 24-7, like it should be doing. And it is doing. Legislate, legislation, policy work is a big part of that. And we've been able to get some big wins here in California around criminal justice um, reforms, thanks to Governor Brown, our outgoing governor. And we hope that we can stay on that page and continue to be a leader in criminal justice reforms. And I think we can. And I'm so happy to be a part of this panel today. And I'm just looking forward to our conversation. So I'll pass the mic to Kobe. Hello, everyone. Um, <laughs> I'm also so honored to be here with this panel and with everybody in the room and thankful to the organizers. Um, also, I just want to shout out, we have a lot of our CCWP LA team in the room. Raise your hand. <laughs> and also CCWP Bay. It's always over there somewhere. Um, so um, let's see. The longer I had there, the more pressing issues I came up with. So <laughs> I'm, um, I'm going to try to make this that part quick. But um, I did come up with a lot in my head. I had decided to only talk about one. But now we've got four. Ready? One. Um, survivors. So with, the, with Survived and Punished Rights, part of what we've been doing is try to bring more attention nationally and in all of the different regions where people are um, fighting defense campaigns for survivors of domestic and sexual violence who've been criminalized. Um, and are often incarcerated for very long terms. Um, so, you know, part of what we've been trying to do with that work is make sure that it's very clear in, in all of the organizing materials and all of our training materials that this is not an exceptional problem, right? And I just, it, um, gonna use some, some corrections department evidence to back this up since we don't have enough research about um, this intersection. Um, which is that I was at an event recently where the head of the women's prisons um, in California started her speech by acknowledging that, and there were many incarcerated um, people in the room, uh, mostly women, and uh, she started out by saying that um, she understood that the majority of people in women's prisons are survivors of domestic and sexual violence. She said she thought at least maybe 80%, maybe 90%. Um, the reason why she was saying this um, was because she wanted to acknowledge that incarcerated um, people in the women's prisons uh, would need more support uh, because they've already been through so much trauma and now they're incarcerated. 
Um, she wasn't saying all of the other kinds of trauma that come with incarceration, um, but there was an, a kind of an acknowledgement in it. And, and then she said, you know, so we need to make sure to be doing suicide prevention because what we have here are prisons filled with survivors, right, um, who are highly traumatized, and then we will fill in the blanks, and who are continuing to be more and more traumatized through the practices of incarceration, right? Um, so that's one thing. This is not an exceptional problem. Um, we don't have enough research across all of the prisons. So that includes people in the men's prisons. We are pretty sure there is an extremely high rate of survival of abuse um, for people across all prisons. We know this is true uh, for trans women who are usually incarcerated in the men's prisons, but not exclusively, right? So this is a major, major problem. And it also, um, it's a problem in terms of traumatizing and torturing and isolating people and separating people from communities and families and so on, right? And we know that this problem attacks people of color, uh, women of color, trans people, poor people, and so on, um, immigrants. Um, so that, all to say, um, yeah, I guess just that, it's not an exception. <laughs> um, there was another point, but I lost it. Okay, I'm gonna move to number two. Um, I would just wanna say, I know Sarah mentioned it um, in her introduction, but CIW, in case people don't know, is the second um, state women's prison uh, in California, and it's just in Chino, um, Corona, so it's 45, 50 minutes east of here. Um, and until recently, they had the highest suicide uh, rate in the country, um, eight times the rate um, for people in women's prisons, five times the rate for people in California prisons, period, right? Um, CCWP, working with people inside and out, um, helped to expose that. Um, we needed attention to be, you know, we, we needed intervention, basically, um, and we're following the lead of people inside who are desperate for that kind of attention and support. So we organized with family members who lost loved ones, with incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, um, to demand um, an investigation. And there's this audit that was produced um, that is uh, important reading material, I think, um, about the suicide crisis. Um, and they, they look at four prisons, including CIW. Um, so you can look at that at the state auditor's website for some information about you know what was and what continues to go on there. Um, because of the attention, there's been you know some efforts to to slow the the crisis, but we do know that the same practices um, continue to exist in terms of this kind of escalating um, uh, practices of isolating people when they're in mental health crisis, um, and we know that that only creates more crisis, right? So even though you know there hasn't been a death in in a period of time, and this was part of why we were fighting and organizing, right, to, to make sure that people can survive their time and be released. Um, this is a very tenuous, tenuous thing, right? Because we're caging highly traumatized people um, and then uh, policing them 24 seven. Um, and we know about some of the trouble with policing, especially when it's unchecked, but also period. Um, so that was number two, Ooh, I better hurry up. Number three um, uh, is a pressing concern, um, a worry, which I know I share with many people in the room, is that as we organize, as we get more organized across our movements and in, in, in coalition, um, that the system will come up with new ways to make it appear um, like this, like uh, a softer, um, more helpful cage, right? But we know that these are still cages and that they harm people um, families and communities, period, right? So I just saw um, a couple days ago, maybe pe some people saw this, uh, some county won an award for innovation because they created a um, de-escalation room, they called it, um, for youth who are in cages. And so the room has bright colors, there's balls. Um, I don't remember where it is. Did anybody else see this video? I couldn't really watch the whole thing through, right? Um, but this is uh, likely in response to the a very amazing, very painful organizing um, around solitary confinement, including the hunger strike in Pelican Bay led by incarcerated people and their families, right? So the system will adapt and find new ways, more sophisticated language um, to do the same practices, which can make it scarier, right? Because it might appear like there have been some changes or people can defend a, a certain kind of practice. Um, so that, and then the very last thing, which was the actual thing I was gonna say, um, <laughs> is that I think um, what's very pressing, um, I think for us and the people that we work with in the women's prisons um, is sentencing uh, reform, um, which happens like we're Marilyn saying at the Capitol, um, to uh, start carving away at these very, very powerful, um, very entrapping 
uh, murder laws in California. And so we were able to do some of that in coalition last year um, by, by reforming the felony murder rule some, and that's a longer story. Um, but there are so many different kinds of laws um, that in particular entrap women and trans people in all sorts of ways. Um, so aiding and abetting laws, for example. We need to completely um, reform that. And the women's prisons in particular are filled with people who are in um, for somebody else's um, violence or for, you know, allegedly someone else's violence. I'll leave it there for now. So, okay, that was a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, so I, I actually wanted to, um, and, you know, feel free to um, just sort of converse amongst yourselves. You know, I wanted to give everyone an opportunity to sort of start off with something, but, um, you know, but, um, so, um, you know, um, thinking gender, right? Um, <laughs> um, so, you know, um, maybe if you all could say a little bit um, or, or talk about, you know, why, you know, something like feminist politics is important to your anti-carceral work. Um, you know, what a kind of feminist politics brings to, um, you know, anti-carceral work. Um, and then um, also the other way, um, you know, how does engaging in anti-carceral organizing um, sort of challenge sort of, you know, traditional concepts of feminism or, you know, gender or, um, you know, sexuality and, and whatnot. You know, I mean, Beth, you mentioned, um, you know, some of the the um, c concerns you have about uh, sort of um, the anti-black racism that is not being dealt with in um, in violence movements, right? Um, and uh, in gender violence movements. Um, so, um, you know, that is obviously one aspect of it. Um, but I wonder if, you know, um, we could also open it up to, you know, you as well as the other panelists to talk a little bit about um, the intersection of um, anti carceral work and feminism. I thought I did that. Right now. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I was trying to figure out how to respond to that question. We got the questions in advance. That doesn't mean we really know how to answer them, but we did get a chance to think about them. For me, I, I feel like we cannot do um, abolition work without doing it from a black feminist lens. I, mean, I don't know what that would look like. And, you know, I, I invite I invite people to think about that a little bit. I mean, for me, it really means kind of going back to school a little bit on radical feminist politics deeply informed by black feminist theory. And I don't mean like we have to have a, th I'm not saying we have a theoretical answer. I'm saying that we know something about intersectionality, don't we, Kim? We know a little bit about intersectionality. We know something about structural violence being important, that's, and structural violence is a, we have to work against structural violence in order to work against the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration, that's structural violence, and that also is gonna help us in our gender violence work, right? We have to know that the people who are most affected uh, are the wise ones, and we have to look inside prisons to understand how to end the caging of people, and we have to listen to survivors tell their stories so that we're informed by real life work, isn't that standpoint theory, to go everyday knowledge, right? So I'm not saying that we need to read books on black feminist theory, although we could read, reread, we could reread books, but we have to think about what the messages are about a liberatory praxis, and that's how we're gonna end, that's how we're gonna bring um, abolition forward and and the part of that for me that is s hardest in some ways is the part of especially black feminist theory that says we're strong we've got resources uh, we have to imagine we have to uh, live our lives and do our work and raise our children and have relationships and write our books and run our academic programs in a way that's consistent with the politic of liberation and we're, you know, most of the hours of the day we're not doing that, but we have to be trying to do that all the time. That's what I was hearing in some ways. And so, to me, 
the, the, it's inseparable to think about um, gender freedom and uh, abolition. I can't imagine you could do one without the other. Thank you, but I just want to uh, comment on a couple of things that Kobe mentioned, uh, sentencing. And so in California, there's, there's over 110 sentencing um, enhancements uh, in the penal code that can increase a person's time based on their affiliation or whether or not they've had prior convictions, et cetera. And in reducing sentencing enhancements and eliminating and eliminating those things, folks get to come home a lot sooner. Instead of being punished for things that they've already done under the auspices that being tough on crime increases public safety. The more time you do, the less likely you are to commit another offense. Where most people return to prison, not because it's a new offense, but it's some violation or some reason that the parole or probation officer decided that they didn't do and it was worthy of them going back inside. So in eliminating sentencing enhancements, we make not only folks accountable, we talk about being accountable, you know, for their time, we also make the state think about ways to really provide services and opportunities for folks who are caught up in this revolving door. Because if doing an additional year or five or 10 years or 15 years for an enhancement is not the answer, what is the answer? So when we think about abolition, you know, how are we going to get smart on addressing what's really the problem? Why are people going into these places in the first place? What is it that they're not getting in the community? And though, that's where we start. I think that's how we eliminate prisons. Those who come in out, we provide resources, services, access to quality housing, health care, education, employment. We all know what the barriers are for folks who have criminal records, but we're not providing that access for all of us so that we can reinvent ourselves or get our lives back on track or just go on with our life without having to be held hostage by that thing that you did back then. And so we really need to think about reinvesting those correction dollars into community programs, into access to higher education, into health care, so that folks have their needs met when they come out. Because if we come out and we don't go back, the recidivism rate in California goes from 64% to zero, then we can continue to shut down these prisons. And shout out to Justice LA for, for blocking the, the expansion of, of those two new jails in LA. So great work, CCWP was a part of that work along with some other fantastic organizations. So we just have to think about people not going back and reentry is a big part of that. When folks get out, especially after serving long sentences, now what are we coming home to? What have we learned inside of these cages that we've been locked in for so long? Are we wiser and smarter and stronger? Or are we just older <laughs> and unhealthy and dependent on the state? and docile, incapacitated. So what do you want us to be when we come home? Do you want us to be con contributing members of society? Or do you want us to be a burden? Because we need to invest more dollars, more time, more scholarship on building programs and opportunities for folks who are deserving of a life prison. So I just wanted to touch on that. Because if we don't, then we get re-traumatized by not feeling welcome, by not having access to resources, and then we are, then we become victims of the state 
and then the state, of course, as an apparatus of punishment, decides that we're only deserving of the cage and we go back in and then we start to internalize that and we start to feel like that's our only space that we can navigate, that we feel comfortable in because we're not accepted anywhere else. And that's just not true. We are all deserving of a place to live, of a job, of a college education, of healthy food and water. We're working for folks to have access to all of these things. And we need to think about reentry in a way that we haven't imagined before. And I think in reimagining reentry, we reimagine a world without prison. So what if one part of the question was uh, what makes your abolitionist work feminism? Like where's the, where's, what, what is the gender politics of your abolitionist work? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. um, I, I, uh, the first thing that I thought of when I, when I read your question and heard your question again is um, pace and, and, and practice. And there's a way in which abolitionist movement, abolitionist organizing can become extremely detached. Um, it, it can it can hold some of the same kind of masculinist, macho stuff that other revolutionary projects have, and I I ha and I'm, I'm and when I say that, let me just be very clear: I'm not not guilty of it. You know what I mean? Like it's like when you're part of the left, you get caught up. And the other thing is that when you're there's also a way in which the relationships um, with the people that you're doing political work with can also get caught up in the politics of academia. And we have to be careful, of th those of us who are doing both things or trying to do both things um, or figuring out like some sort of relationship between them, um, like, trying to, I, this is my first year as a faculty member. Sort of, you know. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it, but, um, but also it's a little, it's, a, it's like, you, you, know, you know things about the academic industrial complex and then you actually become like a, right? And so, and then you're like, oh wait, and am I, and am I, am I being pulled into some funky shit that I shouldn't be pulled into, you know what I mean? Like, is this a, like, being, being mindful? Anyways. <laughs> so, one of the, one of the, the, I've done organizing for 25 years. It's been a long time. Um, I'm very grateful for all of it. Um, I've learned a lot from CCWP um, the past few years. <laughs> it's just a brilliant organization. You should really look into it if you don't know already. Um, and one of the things that I've learned and, and through CCWP's um, legacy of organizing inside prison and inside outside and outside um, has been this profound practice of building sustained relationships with incarcerated folks. And, um, <laughs> and even when I, I was part of the Free Marissa Now mobilization campaign, but, and this is just me being real here, I just was, I had so much I, I was ready to do the organizing. I worked really hard at it. I had a lot of big thoughts about it and whatnot, right? But I never wrote to her. Like, I, I didn't meet her until she was released because I was a little scared and shy. Um, and so C watching CCWP move through the world and learning from them and, le and CCWP's impact on Survive and Punish, which, I'm, which I am part of, um, showed me the importance of building a relational practice um, that's thoughtful and accountable and grounded, um, grounded to, you know, people 
I'll just leave it there, just grounded. And um, uh, how critical that is in informing how abolitionist work is supposed to be. And so through CCWP's influence on SP, SP built a, a prison visiting team. It's, it's small, but it's dedicated. Um, and our, the folks that we visit at, um, in Chowchilla, the, the women's prison near Fresno, um, are all survivors of domestic and sexual violence who've been criminalized. And so, you know, now I'm going with Colby and a couple of other wonderful people to do these visits every couple of months. And it's just, I, I almost don't want to talk about it because I don't want it to be, I don't want it to land like, a cool factor, because that's not that's not what it that's not the point. The point is that it was such a um, such a uh, a lesson in terms of the way that you put yourself out there, the risk that you take. You put your 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 heart. I was going to say your money, but I was going to be anti-capitalist about it. So you put your heart, your real heart, where your mouth is. And you take that risk, and you build those relationships, and you and you and you are there. You don't, you don't not show up, right? You're there. Um, anyways, that there's something about the relationality, the 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 politics of intimacy, the politics of accountability, um, um, and the and the meaningful risk um, that bec that became part of my abolitionist practice. Um, this sort of, you know, it, 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 it definitely deepened this last part of my work. That was very moving. Do you want to say something? Okay. So, there, I, I was having two reactions to what you were saying. One is the way you were talking about an abolition practice. practice is very much how we began the modern day incarnation of anti-violence work. It wasn't shelters, counseling, support group, but it was, what happened? What, tell me, tell me, come, oh, my heart is hearing your heart, right? And that's why initially a kind of grassroots feminist organizing strategy worked to bring liberation because it was a relational uh, it was a relational political practice not a social service industry so it's a cautionary tale abolitionists right don't become a social service uh, industry that's called you know abolition because uh, that's what we've done wrong. And so that I was very moved by how you described that. Um, I also was um, inspired to think about, like it's sort of hard for me to uh, remember that this is your first year teaching, because uh, you've been teaching for so long. And so to me, there's a question about scholar activism that I think is, really like the, the, the wrong order of the words. Because I think we need to think of ourselves as activists who work sometimes as scholars. And that then says, like the activists inside and out are the teachers. And some of us are paid to work at universities. Some of us aren't paid at all and are in cages. And I think if we put activism before the scholar part, because just like everyone's an abolitionist, everyone's an activist scholar, you know? And I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that you all aren't at all. I know I'm not every day, at, or, you know, I'm not always, and I'm never as much of that as I want, but if, if we put our commitment to activism, and then we figure out where we do our work, some, sometimes it's in a university, sometimes it's in a community organization, sometimes it's, you know, just with our people, you know, who, don't understand anything we're talking about some of the time. So I think there's something in that, um, in the order of the activist scholar thing that's wrong, and it, it, it takes us down a path of healing, like just because we're in a university and write a radical book, we are contributing to abolition. You know. Oh, 
I like to just leave that one there. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I mean, there's so much to say. I, I so appreciate what everyone's sharing, and I um, have also I've learned so much about this relational practice um, through uh, CCWP's model and, and other organizations that work with the same kind of model, like the Trans um, Gender Ger Gender Variant Justice Project, Intersex Justice, Justice Project (TGIJP) in the Bay. Um, so there's there's a set of grassroots groups, right, that do this model of um, making sure to prioritize. Um, supporting and building relationship with and um, fighting alongside and with um, and for people who are incarcerated. And I that CCWP started from the inside, right? Um, as I think Sarah mentioned too, and uh, that there's so much power that I've seen, even with very small grassroots groups, right? With very little funding, there's so much power in, I think, an organizing model that's relationship built. And I think there's so much potential, obviously, and, and hopefully in real life, you know, um, actual just material reality of uh, survival and freedom and also transformative justice and so much in that in that work and I think um, I was reading in a book that Elisa was carrying around earlier I can't Apple something um, <laughs> I, I saw a couple people that I know who are incarcerated in Chow Chiller were quoted um, in a chapter that Mianta McKnight um, wrote and she's also formerly incarcerated and they were talking about uh, the kinds of transformative justice work that they're doing inside prison to try to avoid some of the violent policing that happens every day. Um, and so just as another note to say that there's so, you know, there's so much to learn that under these like extremely violent conditions that people are surviving about how people survive. Um, and there's so much to support um, that it really is a desperate situation in every single one of these prisons and every single one of these units. Um, people need support. and. Um, that's not what the system is is set up to do. It's not. It, they're not going to get it there. So it relies on the community to to do everything we can to support people through that and out. And then in terms of feminist politics, I agree. It's just it's at the at the center, right? So the um, we know um, because of black feminist scholars and others, um, but primarily so that patriarchy is a, is at the very center. It's the very heart of carceral violence and alongside white supremacy and settler colonialism and ableism. Um, so it, and it upholds everything about prisons. And there, because people who are incarcerated are so disappeared in so many ways, um, that there, and there's so little um, ethical uh, research about why people are serving the kinds of time that they are, what are the patterns, right? Um, that we don't know a lot of the patterns that exist, but we, from experience with all of our different community groups doing this work and so many people that we work with inside, um, sharing their experience, people coming out, getting involved in the movement on the outside too and sharing their experience. Like we know that, that um, the patriarchy is part of the reason why people are, I mean, it's, it's, this is why our prisons are filled, right? So there's gender violence um, and then there's, there's the gender violence that takes a lot of people to prison, both cis men and cis women and certainly trans people um, of all sorts of genders and gender nonconforming people. Uh, and then there is the gender violence that persists in prison and that's, that's, uh, that is a particularly brutal against people who are interpreted as resisting the gender binary, right? Whether that's willful or not, whether, you know, it doesn't matter, uh, it is extremely threatening um, to the prison state, to the police state and people experience that threat uh, through violence on their bodies. And so part of our work in coalition with, with many groups, including TGIJP, is to center um, and, and make sure to do everything we can, possibly even with very little funding, to support um, transgender and gender nonconforming people who are, at, who are facing that level of violence inside. And we do believe that that will um, help free everyone, right? Um, because people are at the very, uh, at the epicenter basically of, of this kind of gender violence that the system is also built on and persists through, I guess. Well, so I cannot believe it, but um, I think I have to kind of ask my last question and so that we have a little bit of time to open it up to the audience. And so, you know, um, what I had um, wanted to ask you all about to sort of end on kind of a, a high note, um, a, a number of different kinds of successes and victories and successes in quotation marks, 
Right. Um, <clears throat> we've seen um, at the last um, CCWP general meeting, actually, one of our members, Joe Hankins, coined a term pain joy, which we found very helpful to as a descriptor for what it feels like to have these kind of successes and wins, right? Um, but um, so with that kind of caveat in mind, um, I wonder if, um, you know, we can talk a little bit about um, some of the accomplishments right um you know both recently but also sort of long term of um feminist anti-carceral organizing um and um also if you wanted to say something about sort of um you know the future of this work you know what sorts of you know um visions horizons you're sort of looking toward um you know please feel free to say any or all of those things <laughs> Do y'all want to? Do y'all want to kick us off? Okay. Um, yeah, I was. I was thinking as Colby was talking and, and then kind of reflecting on, on some things that Elisa had had said about um, organizing work in prison and, and and the relational space and the feminist space that's within prisons and. You know, women stick together in prison. You know, I, I know there's sometimes uh, this contrary belief that women don't stick together. We do. If we didn't stick together, none of us would survive. It is because of women's prisons being that feminist space where we can sit together and, and think about, you know, how we're being oppressed and what are we going to do about it how we construct ways of resisting the carceral state that only a, a, a feminist could do in supporting each other's survival. You know, how do we care for one another and transform a cage into a classroom or into a kitchen or a hair braiding salon? We do these things in prison. And a lot of times there's this ideology, this theory, these ideals out there that folks who are incarcerated are savage, are uneducated, or violent and unworthy. But we are some of the most loving people to one another inside. Yeah, we fight and fuss, and sometimes people get hurt. But we do all that in all y'all communities, too. <laughs> Folks in prison create community because we know that the person in the cell next to us has problems, problems that we need to address that hasn't been addressed in the community, that's not being addressed by the state, that's not being addressed by the prison regime. No one's addressing those issues. And if I don't take care of my sister, who will? And so when I think about anti-carceral feminism, I think about the women who care for me inside the prison and who I care for and how they offered their skills, whether it was hair braiding or making tamales or rubbing my feet because I was a firefighter or whatever it was, we cared for one another until we got out. And then we connected with the movement so that we can continue to reach back and pull another person out. And so that's what, that's what it's all about. Strange places that we can't really talk about in a way that folks can comprehend that's only writing about them from the outside because our perspective from the inside is much different than your perspective from the outside. I'm hoping that in the next five or six years, those of you who want to write about and do research around, you know, anti-prison work, prisons, you know, 
you have to connect with someone who has this lived experience. Only we can share things about how we resist that place, how we belong, how we create that space, transform that space, but most of all survive those conditions where some of you wouldn't last a day. Wouldn't last a day. And women are still there. I have friends who were there when I went in in 88 who are still there surviving every day. So I wanted to say that, that we have to figure out ways to continue to support those inside, encourage them, because if they don't survive, if I hadn't have survived, then I, I think the movement, you know, doesn't really have meaning if we don't survive. We have to survive. Do you want me to list some victories? Some joy, some pain, joy, victories? Okay. <laughs> Where Marilyn always makes me cry, but I also can handle it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So um, some people know this, but I think it's good public information. This is like a PSA. Um, under Governor Brown, uh, we had 283 sentence commutations in California. Hey. Um, this is a very big deal because it's often maybe two under a governor's term, right? He was at the end of his time. He is not a saint. He did a lot of terrible things that added to the problem of mass criminalization and incarceration in California. And he had some regrets about that. Um, and we were able collectively um, to take advantage of that and are also very grateful that he did some of the things that he did. So um, of those 283 people, um, just over half were originally sentenced to life without parole, uh, which is also huge politically for him to make that move. And also that means, you know, uh, half of 283, whoever can do that math. Um, but all 283 people, if they didn't already have the chance, now have the chance to go through the parole process or were um, released immediately. Um, this is not an answer to the problem of mass criminalization and incarceration, but it is a huge, huge act um, of freedom for this set of people. And it is a huge statement in terms of the problems um, and the op oppression of life without parole sentencing in particular. So now we're gonna also have this population of people who've been organizing inside to support each other and to fight extreme sentencing out. There's already people, um, you know, quite a few people who've been commuted who are hitting the capital steps um, and pushing for all the next moves and doing many other things in community. So that's an amazing victory. And uh, 31 of those, those people were from the women's prisons um, of the people sentenced to life without. And uh, a good majority of them we've been working with, with CCWP. Um, so that is a very exciting thing. And then, uh, then do you wanna say something about the indigent? Yeah. Okay, from Maryland wants me to make this announcement. Um, we were able to pass um, a Assembly Bill 2533 last year, which was under the radar. Um, so this is another PSA. Uh, so incarcerated, pe the poverty threshold for incarcerated people in California, it was at $1 a month, which meant that if you didn't, if you had more than $1 a month on your books, even if it was a dollar uh, and two cents, uh, it meant that you did not have access to basic, basic hygiene supplies um, or uh, access to mail, to use the correspondence through the mail with the courts, which is huge, right? Um, and so we were able to, to get that poverty threshold lifted from $1 a month to $25 a month, which uh, sounds maybe not like a huge victory, um, but most people are making, you know, terrible slave wages of average around $12 a month. So that means, like, before people who were working were not able to, uh, to, to get any of those basic supplies. So um, that's a bill that we are now uh, following up on with Initiate Justice and others um, to get rid of the medical co-pays in the jails and the prisons in California. So incarcerated people are charged currently um, $5 in the prisons for every medical visit, um, $3 in the jails. Not all counties charge, but they're able to. Um, and we're working on changing that, and we already had a uh, victory on that one. Yes, we did. The, uh, just to uh, elaborate a little bit more on what Colby said, for, for folks who are incarcerated and who are making that eight cents or 10 cents or 12 cents an hour, it takes 60 hours for them to earn enough money to initiate a doctor's visit. And so 60 hours of work may be 
digging ditches, laying pipe, scraping walls, you know, building furniture, sewing, you know, uniforms for a state agency. I mean, it's, it's hard labor to, to earn enough just to see a doctor. And every time you have to pay something like that, in which we all pay co-pays, I understand that. But within the prison system, when we talk about wages, you know, there's also restitution. Folks who are incarcerated automatically pay 55% restitution from any wages that they make and any monies that they receive. So your money goes down to a dollar real quick. So if all you had was a dollar on your account for that 30-day period, you can't even buy a tube of toothpaste, nor will the state give you a tube. But some people think that prisons are these country club facilities where the state is actually providing you with hygiene, with, with, with clothing, with food, with everything that you need, education. Those things are there, but they are not adequate. If you have a dollar or more, you don't get a tube of toothpaste from the state. You don't get deodorant, lotion, a toothbrush. You don't get anything. So you have to create community. You have to transform your hustle in a way that you can survive and provide for yourself in these cages. The state is not providing for us. The $80,000 a year that it costs to incarcerate one adult person in a state prison is going towards training correctional officers, making sure that they have equipment, making sure that offices are staffed. That's where the money goes. It does not go into providing folks inside with quality care, clothing, access to health care. If you don't have family members on the outside or support systems, organizations, people lobbying for you, rallying for you, sending you those money orders and checks, you, you really don't have anything. And so raising this indigent bill from $1 to $25 was huge. It made the state accountable to 80,000 more incarcerated people that they would have to provide basic hygiene items to, which they were not providing for decades. That's how big this is. If you don't know that, you really need to wrap your head around that. These are some of the victories, some of the successes and wins that we've had. When we talk about suicide and getting SB 960 passed to create that suicide reporting bill so that now the state has to report how they're dealing with folks who are attempting suicide, how they're contacting family members of those who have committed suicide in their care. We have to start addressing some of these issues and that's what these bills do. These are huge wins, sentencing reforms, huge wins, voting rights, huge wins. We have to continue to do these things and folks up here on this stage have been working incredibly hard and I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of CCWP. Uh, is anyone else here from Chicago besides Chicago? Yeah. So yeah, I just will say a few things about Chicago. We have um, some trouble there, but we have some good things, right? So there was very exciting organizing around the No Cop Academy. People coming together and saying, you can't build a training site for police officers. We need that money, divest from that and reinvest in our communities. It was very exciting and moving. Uh, it didn't win all the way, but the organizing led to an interesting um, way that people who identified as abolitionists therefore were well poised to respond quickly um, to, I was, to the issue, I'm going to say, the issue of R. Kelly. And I say that to say that part of the win to me around organizing is having your community ready to respond, right, when you need people to show up for something. And, and therefore, and there were key people who were making connections between issues around that. Um, the gang database uh, has had its first level of um, uh, elimination 
in Chicago in the last few days. That is very important, long story about it, but that is very important. Um, not much discussion about women on that database, even though women are there, and trans people on that database, but again, that's the frontier we need to work on. And then I also wanted to just lift up and um, the work that some people, especially um, women of color who work in mainstream anti-violence programs are doing now to say, oops, <laughs> we made a mistake. Not we, the people doing the work, the corrective work, but oops, y'all made a mistake. <laughs> and it's, it's moving to me to sit now with people who I've been sitting with and arguing with for 40 years, for people to say, my hands are dirty on that. You know, we made a mistake, we have to course correct. What's our um, culpability? Uh, how do we undo what we did? You were right, you know, all those things, I'm sorry. All those things matter, and I have been moved by the small group of people who work primarily in state-level organizing, state coalitions of domestic violence and sexual assault programs who are, are kind of getting right, finally listening. And I, I, you know, when people change their mind and change their heart, they should be recognized for doing that, right? Especially when they try to undo what they did. And, and I guess the last thing I want to say about that is uh, let's not, every time someone comes home, it is a victory. And I think it's an abolition practice, I think, that we need to celebrate that more. And I'm like, like where's our welcome home committees? Or we, we've been waiting for you, or we've got you now, or there they are, right here, okay. Because it matters, I mean, to come home to love, to radical love that said, we're sorry you were gone, and we uh, now you are ours again. I think it's important, and every time someone comes home, we need to be there. Um, on that note, uh, um, the Survive and Punish was founded by uh, three organizations slash defense campaigns. So there's the um, Stand With non -He campaign, which was Bay-based, California-based, um, to free non -He Joe. Uh, free Marissa Now, Mobilization Campaign National, and the Chicago Alliance to free Marissa Alexander. Um, and CCWP and their campaign to free Kelly Savage was on the, in the foreground there. Um, so I think we got together, I think our first meeting was 2016, right? And all three of those ladies are free. And that's just, and the thing is, I mean, in 2016, I mean, we didn't know. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know what was going to happen with Marissa's case. Um, actually, I'm not sure. She might have been on her way by then. But the, um, but Kelly was um, sentenced to life without parole. She was in prison for um, essentially a failure to protect charge, uh, meaning her husband tragically killed her child and she was punished for it. Um, and I, I mean, we moved forward as if she was gonna be free, but we also knew the stakes. I mean, we, what I mean is not the stakes, but we certainly knew the stakes, but the, um, the likelihood given how difficult it is for people sentenced to LWAP it is to be free. And then I remember the night, <laughs> it was like Christmas or something, right? Um, when Kobe came home and said that Kelly had been commuted and I was like, I, I think I took five steps back because I, I was scared of the information because um, I, didn't, I didn't know what to think, you know? And then she was commuted and then she went up to, and it's very hard, once you're commuted, it's very, very hard to get paroled because the parole board, sexist, transphobic, just a, a big problem. Anyways, um, she got paroled her first time out, which was a miracle. Um, since then, we have seen uh, the, the women, the survivors that we've been working with at, at S&P, um, you know, Barbara Chavez, you know, I, I, could, I could name them, but I'm, I'm moved, so it's hard for me to remember names. But there, there were a number of them. And I didn't anticipate that all those women would be commuted. I didn't think that that was going to happen. I didn't know. But we were in an extraordinary situation. 
the pain, the pain part of that pain joy is that there were these other women who were hoping for commutation, and then they didn't get it by the time that Brown left. And then we have to figure out how to like hold them, right? And in solidarity and keep pushing um, and not let this Brown moment of high, high commutations be like a temporary thing. One of the cool things is that while we were doing this work in California, we had our talking points because we're good organizers. We're like, yay, Brown, go with the comm commutations, you know, and over here, like, get it together, Brown, right? Because 200 and some odd commutations is great. We want to see everybody commute it. Like, you know, we understand what, the, what we're trying to do here. That was our, that was, those were our talking points. In New York, with the Survive and Punish crew in New York, they were checking out what we were saying and what was happening in California. They were so smart, they took that information, leveraged it for their state because um, their governor, Cuomo, wasn't commuting anyone. And then I saw on Twitter, like, you know, Miriam Cobb is saying, you know, Brown just commuted another 50 people. <laughs> Cuomo hasn't commuted anyone, you know what I mean? So there's this way in which there's a, um, this visionary abolitionist project that we are invested in. And then there's like, these, uh, these kind of very particular moments of um, strategy that work out really well, or freedom <laughs> that work out really well, right? Um, so that's, that's one thing of pain joy. The other thing, what, one, uh, one last success, is uh, to build on what Beth is saying. You know, so Insight started in 2000. <laughs> um, and the, the statement came out in 01 and um, the, the CER insight statement that, that basically talked about, like, there, it was, it's great, look that up too. So the, the, there are five points about the ways in which the anti-violence movement went right around uh, criminalization, five ways in which the um, you know, anti-prison movement went right about gender, and then like uh, 11 recommendations, right? It's a great statement, it still holds. Um, and in 2018, 2019, 18 years after, what I have seen with, anti, with mainstream anti-violence organizations, to me, it's unprecedented. I don't know, maybe I should check that out with y'all because I'm like, I swear to God, I've never seen so much conversation with mainstream anti-violence orgs about uh, criminalized survivors. And I believe that Insight, SMP, CCWP, and many, many, many other organizations, the work that has, that has happened over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and so on, um, helped to enable that. It's so hard, it was rough back then, right? Because it was just such a, a push, push. And now it's, it's not so much of a push, push, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a, you have to be careful because of that co-optation issue, right? But still,